This is Brother Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. Good evening, boys and girls, scholars and laymen, ladies and gentlemen, and whatever you want to call yourself. This is Brother Ron. We all be news, radio, and TV. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. Just want to share my thoughts uh, right quick as I can. Uh, a lot of times I just sit back. I hope y'all having a great whatever you celebrate uh, close this year and wishing you amplify blessings for a even better and more fruitful or fruitful, plentiful, grateful 2020. I want to share my thoughts as we close out 2019. A couple of things I've been holding back on. I've been, you know, Pick it up the vibes and the frequencies from other folks. Really enjoying people's commentary, uh, commentaries on certain things. But I just want to weigh in on the Eddie Murphy, Bill Cosby situation and offer a different perspective from what I've been getting from social media. Uh, a lot of people seem like they are in their feelings about the uh, recent uh, Saturday Night Live hosting by Eddie Murphy. His first time on Saturday Saturday Nights Live, a institution he made popular. He actually saved this institution back in the early '80s. Saturday Nights Live, he saved them from extinction. And this is not rare for Black folks to do, as you all know, or you should know that Black exploitation films actually saved Hollywood back in the 1970s when folks stopped going to the movies. It was Black folks, you know, creating movies like. Um, Sweetback's Badass Song, The Mac, Shaft, these type of movies coming out that actually saved, you know, now we know about Dolomite, which saved uh, Hollywood from extinction. And even the recent phenomenon of the Black Panther, the Marvel Universe, you know, they brought, brought a lot of money into the coffers of Disney. But, you know, Eddie Murphy came back on Saturday Night's Live. He was the star of the Dolomite movie, a Netflix uh, success story. It was directed by Craig Brewer, a uh, Miffian who did Hustle and Flow, uh, Black Snake Moan. You know, it's all, you know, it's hard out here for, uh, you know what, that song that won an Oscar, 3 Six Mafia, that was part of the soundtrack for a uh, Hustle and Flow, the movie that was helped spearheaded by the late great John Singleton. So, uh, I said we're talking about Eddie Murphy. I seen the clips and whatnot of his Saturday night live hosting uh historic you know comeback. Some of the highest ratings for Saturday night live that I know of. The, you know, a lot of people watched it. You know, everybody snack was in the building for that and a lot of comic breaks like Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle and some other A-list stars from the world of entertainment were on hand. For Eddie Murphy's comeback, I guess, after being absent from uh, Saturday Night Live for 35 years. You know, he appeared on the 40th anniversary special. I remember seeing that uh, back in 2015. I didn't really look at it. It's been a while since I really looked at Saturday Night Live. To me, Saturday Night Live have not, has not been relevant uh, in terms of this engaging. The Trump bashing, I could do without. I don't care for all the Trump bashing. I mean, excuse me, bashing. I don't care for that. And that's another uh, segment altogether. But uh, I thought it was very funny. I thought Eddie Murphy still got it. He's a He is a comedic genius. No matter what you think about him, he has talent. 
and he has a powerful brand, a powerful legacy, and he still got his chops, I think, because you're doing live TV. Even when he broke out of character, it still was hilarious. And this Eddie Murphy is just naturally funny. His stuff he does, you can't be taught. I mean, and also he's a hell of a mimic. Uh, he does great impersonations of people. Uh, spot on. I mean, he's a genius. He's a creative genius. Uh, brilliant mind. Brilliant man. Uh, yeah, can't take that away from him. Now, I know people had an issue with some of the things he did as it relates to Bill Cosby. And quite frankly, um, he's a comedian. I think people need to get over that fact. Uh, as a comedian, nothing is really off limits. I know that sounds kind of strange and kind of disrespectful, but anything could be made funny, and it, it can, you know. And uh, you know, you think about nine eleven, like like uh, with Chris Rock, brother Tony Rock said, you may not, you might not would have made a joke nine twelve. 2001 but you no know, almost 20 years later people do make 9-11 jokes people do joke about people assassinations like jfk assassinations like i said you know dallas Cowboys season seems to be as dead as a jfk headshot you know jfk was killed in dallas and you look at the dallas cowboys if you are a fan it's hard to look at the dallas cowboys right now to watch them really self-implode kind of like you know you know jfk's head exploding November 22nd, 1963. That was over 56 years ago. No, no, it's not funny. Ha, ha. But, you know, you see what I'm saying? You see where I'm going with this? You know, and really, black people pain has always been white folks' entertainment in this country. Black folks' pain has always been white folks' profit and entertainment in America. Ha, ha, ha. You go back to the days of the entertainment industry. Think about Stephen Foster. Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me. For I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Or you think about uh, T.D. Rice, Thomas Daddy Rice, who created the Minstrel Show. He's a pioneer of the Minstrel Show. He's the pioneer of the character, or the caricature would be known as Jim Crow. Jump Jim Crow. Jump Jim Crow. He created that character, a white man. You know, you think about the immigrants that would come over here that could barely speak English. But they found careers and making fun of black folks who've been here forever uh, by pursuing the black face. You think about you go to ragtime, you go to popular black uh, popular music in America. Like I talk about Stephen Foster, how you use some of that slave stuff, some of the black culture. You think about the banjo. The banjo is an African a black instrument. It's a it's a drum with strings. Okay. Uh, you think about a Grand Ole Opry. Uh, you know, it's you know, old town rule. People make a you know big deal about old town road, but you look at the Grand Ole Opry. Some of the earliest stars of the Grand Ole Opry, which is a country music institution, were black people. They played fiddles and stuff like that. Uh, you think about the guy who trained uh, Hank Williams Sr., who's considered the king of country music. His mom hired a black man named Rufus Payne, aka T Tot, that taught us on how to play guitar and to sing. Um, let me see. Yeah, you go back, you know, to the, you know, origins of ragtime. You know, people talk about Scott Joplin as being the father of ragtime, but it was a cat from Kentucky that should get some credit too, named Ernest Hogan, a black man from Kentucky who wrote one of the best selling ragtime songs, or as they became known as the Coon Song. He wrote a song called All Coons Look Alike to Me. He wrote a song called All Coons look alike to me it became a best-selling song and also it's one of the earliest ragtime songs so this is for scott joplin but you don't really hear too much about ernest hogan now because you know the controversy surrounding the uses of the word coon you know how kind of how some rappers or gangster rappers or whatever rap would use the word nigger but back then the word was coon yeah like a lot of black comedian acts or entertainment acts like you look at williams and walker that's burt williams and George Walker, I'm going to get into them a little bit, the time with Eddie Murphy and all this other stuff, but they used to advertise themselves as the, as the two real coons, the realest coons. Like, think about NWA, niggas with attitude. So this has always been a part of the conversation. But Ernest Hogan lived to regret the uses of the word coon. Because I think my understanding was that he was in Chicago. He was in this saloon, and he heard a, the pianist play a song called All Pimps Look Alike to Me. So you're talking about pimping back then, casually, right? You know, you think about, 
you know, iced tea, sugar free, eight ball, MJG, you think about rap. So they was already rapping, okay? Was, so this rapping hip hop thing, it didn't start in the 1970s. It's been black folks been rapping, and we could just talk about different examples. And uh, I got, you know, whatever I could pepper the conversation with that. But Ernest Hogan was the next saloon in Chicago. He heard the pianist in the saloon play all pimps look alike to me. So you placed the word pimp with the word coon, and the rest is history. It took out like you know. Hot cakes, people was buying this stuff up, you know, sheet music, all coons looking like to me. Uh, one that some of the earliest ragtime competitions involved ragtime players playing that song to win championship and recognition. But I wanna repeat the words or share, share with you the words that Ernest, I mean Ernest Hogan had, the ancestor star had towards the end of his life about the regret because he made a lot of money off that song, but he lost a lot of friends. A lot of people would like, you know, even when the black entertainers would sing that song, they would not say that word coon in that song. But this is what he said allegedly towards the end of his life before he passed away. Relatively a young age. A lot of people don't understand. A lot of these black entertainers back in the day used to work, they would literally, literally work themselves to death. And this is what he said allegedly before he died. He said, that song caused a lot of trouble in and out of show business. But it was also good for show business because at the time, money was short in all walks of life. With the publication of that song, a new musical rhythm was given to the people. Its popularity grew and it sold like wildfire. Wildfire. That one song opened the way for a lot of colored and white songwriters. Songwriters. Finding the rhythm so great, they stuck to it. And now you get... Hit songs without the word coon. Ragtime was the rhythm played in back rooms and cafes and such places. The ragtime players were the boys who played just by ear their own creations of music, which would have been lost to the world if I had not put it on paper. So he served a purpose. He, re, you know, he uh, preserved and documented the songs for posterity, kind of like what W.C. Handy did and Scott Joplin, Naughty Cats. They did not invent necessarily the blues or jazz or ragtime. What they did, why well, they considered the fathers of the music genres, is because they documented the songs from other people. A lot, some of the best players could not um, read the music, quote unquote, read the music. They could play by ear, but they could not necessarily read the music, and so they could not document it for posterity for other folks to play. So you had these brilliant Beethoven. Uh, <laughs> Mozart types of cats, but they couldn't just they, could, they didn't know how to document their stuff. It was like it was a ragtime player named Louis Chauvin or Chauvin. It's a brilliant ragtime player back in the day, but he couldn't read music and he died real young because of some of the work houses. Syphilis was a real big deal back then. It's like it was like the AIDS of his time. A lot of black entertainers end up dying from overwork and from being exposed to STDs that could not be treated at that time. This is decades before. They discovered penicillin could treat syphilis. So you had a cat like Louis Chauvin who could memorize whole music scores one time. He could play this brilliant and all these inventive ideas, but he didn't know how to you know, re uh, write his music. But you had people like Scott Joplin that could hear cats like Louis Chauvin or Louis Chauvin and capture the music and record it for posterity by the written word. So there's what people like Ernest Hogan come in and W.C. Handy and um, Scott Joplin and Louis Chauvin or Chauvin, he died like around 25, like Tupac age of 25. So he died real young, complications from syphilis. But this was a work hazard, and black folks, you know, they weren't taking breaks and whatever. They worked themselves to death. And, you know, um, I would say this about Eddie Murphy. Uh, he reminds me of Burt Williams. Now, I know Cosby. Um, Publicist Andrew White talked about Bill Cosby being a trailblazer uh, for the likes of Eddie Murphy, which is true. But I think what we do not do, we don't go back enough into our past to understand that there's a narrative that needs to be told. There's people that need to be included in the narrative that we got to reclaim the narrative. Yes, Cosby was great. He was a trailblazer, a pioneer, an innovator. But we should give homage to the cats that came way before Cosby. And even Baba Dick Gregory and Pig Meat Markham and Moms Mabel. Let's go back to Burt Williams. He's the father of them all. 
the great Burt Williams is the father of them all. And Eddie Murphy is kind of like our Burt Williams in a way. You know, Burt Williams was a cat born November 12, 1874 in the West Indies. I think West Indies, the Bahamas, Nassau, uh, Antigua, whatever. He was born in the Caribbean, right? He came to America. Uh, I think he wanted to be a Shakespearean actor, but ended up falling to vaudeville, you know, and wearing blackface and connected with this kid named George Walker, this brother from African-American from Kansas, the state Kansas, like with Dorothy, Wizard of Oz, No Place Like Home, Kansas, that Kansas, flat Kansas. Yeah, that Kansas. So he's from there. And they form a great uh, comedy duo, Williams and Walker. And like I said, they used to advertise themselves as the, the two real coons, the realest coons, right? And they did things like they used to do the cakewalk. Cakewalk was like what twerking is today. You know, cakewalk was the big dance of the times, like what twerking is today. Look up uh, cakewalk. Take a look. It's all online. And he did a comedy thing. And they were very popular among black and whites. You know, Burt Williams was a, a high yellow, you know, redhead dude, you know, but he used to wear blackface. And I think sometimes George Walker would wear blackface. He was a chocolate fellow, a chocolate dandy. I think what it is, George Walker would play, uh, I want to say, I think Williams, Burt Williams played the straight man. Like, I mean, well, I mean, straight man in comedy routine. He was a guy that was the victim, whatever. And Walker will play the scheme or whatever. But they were very popular, right? Very popular among uh, whites and blacks. Uh, Burt Williams was also a recording star, one of the first black recording stars. I mean, recording music through the technology of the day. He was a very popular, well selling recording star uh, all the way up to the 1920s when he died. You know, he was like one of the most popular recording stars, black or white. He had one of the first you know, recording contracts for a recording star for Columbia Records. And um, what I can say about him, he created a character called Mr. Nobody. Nobody. And nobody, he was great at pantomime. I mean, mimicking, pantomiming like, a, you know, a mime. He was great at that. He had a routine where he did a poker routine where he would do pantomime. Like he was playing poker, he had the poker face, show how he would lose. I mean, this is a brilliant technician. And uh, it's a movie you could see online called a uh, natural born gambler that features and showcases his, his comedic genius for posterity. I mean, he's brilliant with his facial expressions and everything. And so he was also a star on the Zigfield Follies, kind of like how Eddie Murphy was a star uh, for Saturday Night Live, but he was not appreciated during his time. A lot of his white co workers were very jealous of Burt Williams and his popularity and his, and his success. Sometimes they would not perform with Burt Williams. They refused to, you know, you know, play nice. But Zigfield, the guy who created Zigfield Files, which was the Saturday Night Live of the early 1900s. See, we didn't have TV, but they had Broadway, they had stage. And Zigfield Files is like what Saturday, uh, Saturday Night Live was at one point. It was a premier institution to showcase the latest and greatest in entertainment. So he was a star. And Zigfield believed in that star, but his co-workers didn't care for him because they didn't want black men getting all that shine. They didn't want the shine to get all the shine. They didn't want the shine to get all the shine. See how it works? So they used to boycott him, but uh, Zigfield paid him very, very well. Uh, like He had a three-year contract at one point in the, in the 19-teens uh, that paid him will be today's equivalent of $1.5 million a year. So you'll get like $1.5 million a year in, in today's money for three years with Zigfield at one point. And then eventually they will allow the white women to interact with Burt Williams on the stage, which is a big deal back in 1912. Because it was lynching a black person every day or day and a half in this country for looking at white people, for, for, for touching by accident a white woman. You know, this is like, think about how big, this is the time of Jack Johnson, right? Where Jack Johnson was speeding up and down the highways and byways of the South, you know, paying $50, $100 speeding tickets uh, with white women in his car. This is the time where this, all this happening. So Burt Williams was very popular. He's so popular and so in demand, but also he felt the sting of racism from time to time, if not all the time, he felt that sting. Uh, he talked about it at one point in an essay about dealing with racism as a successful black man. 
Uh, it was one point he was at a hotel bar at the Hotel Astor, a you know, prestigious hotel in New York. And the bartender said, if I serve you, it'll cost you $50 to get a drink. And Burt Williams said, okay. He pulled out a, a wad of bills, $100 bills. He had a lot of $100, $50 bills. He said, I'm buying a round for the whole house or for the whole room. I buy a round for everybody. That's Burt Williams. Like, this is Burt Williams said, okay, you going to charge me $50? Well, let me buy $50 drinks for everybody in the room. And, you know, W.C. Fields had a great quote about Burt Williams. He said, Burt Williams was the funniest man he ever saw, but the saddest man he ever knew. He said, Burt Williams was the funniest man he ever saw, but the saddest man he ever knew. So Burt had all these trappings of success, but still he was not respected because of the sin was in his skin. What did he do to be so black and blue? That is the question. So Burt Williams was that guy. And Eddie Murphy, we all know he could do his mimicry and you know impersonation. So he's a part of that Burt Williams narrative. And I think Burt Williams should be better talked about than he is. Because he was like one of the most popular black people or people, period. Not only in America, but on the planet. And now he's rarely talked about or mentioned when it comes to comedy greats. You know, um, people talk about Lenny Bruce. They never forget Lenny Bruce, you know, that uh, Marvelous Miss Maisel, that great show on Amazon Prime. I applaud them for uh, reintroducing the legacy of Lenny Bruce to a new generation of people. Um, uh, my sister, she loves that show, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And it's a good show. I really like it myself. Uh, she didn't know Lenny Bruce was a real person. So, you know, you got somebody like Dick Gregory who just passed away, Ancestor, who had a lot of reverence and respect for Lenny Bruce. And that was one of his peers, but, you know, like with Dick Gregory was reintroduced to a new audience via the internet, via platforms like we all be in other platforms. So that's how we got to do. We got to reintroduce the greatness of Burt Williams, which has been documented uh, to a new generation. So that's what I'm doing with the things I'm doing. So I'm going to find that uh, thing about Burt Williams, that uh, quote he had about racism. And um, Duke Elton did a portrait a sound portrait of Burt Williams. So many great people, man, I could talk about. You know, people don't talk about Florence Mills. And, you know, even uh, Burt Bert Williams' uh, partner's wife, Aida Overton Walker, she's, to me, the mother of modern dance. She's the queen of the cakewalk. Like I said, that's a dance that's equivalent to uh, twerking in its way. I mean... See, we got to think about Cardi B or think about uh, Megan Thee Stallion. She was kind of like, you know, she, she had a little thing with the cakewalk. And uh, she was gorgeous. Beautiful sister. Sister was gorgeous, man. She's one of my my Black History dream girls. You know, I, I have this fantasy about having a dinner with people like her. Aida Walker, uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett. Uh, Lil Harder Armstrong, the wife of Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, Satchmo, the one that made him a superstar. Um, it's a couple of women. <laughs> I like to help them. I love to get, pick their brains. Black history dream girls of mine. So she's definitely one. Look up uh, Aida Overton Walker. I used to say her name Ida, but people say Aida. So we'll go with that. Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt, you know, thing with me. Um, but yeah, Burt Williams was that guy. And uh, he should be better. Remember, I know Spike Lee did the movie Bamboozle. Uh, that kind of introduced, I remember, Bamboozle is a pretty good movie. I know people go crazy with the Klansman. I haven't seen the Klansman as of this date, you know, December 27, 2019. But I have seen Bamboozle almost 20 years ago. It's hard to believe. And that's why I really uh, was introduced to that comedic genius known as Paul Mooney because he played Damon Wayne's dad in Bamboozle. And uh, Jada Smith character talked about the contributions of uh, Burt Williams. They did. They showed a little footage of him doing his uh, thing in a natural born gambler. And you can see that movie online. Take a look. It's all online. And uh, she, I guess the guy she talked to was Savion Glover. You're playing a guy named Mantan. Then he had the roots as the as the band on the TV show. So uh, yeah, I should check out Bamboozle. It's a very deep movie. I thought for one of Spike Lee's 
most underappreciated efforts, I believe, bamboozled. But this is what Burt Williams had to say in his own words about being uh, uh, black in a white society. He said, people sometimes ask me if I would not give anything to be white. I answer most emphatic emphatically, no. How do I know what I might be if I were a white man? I might be a sand hog burying away and losing my health for $8 a day. I might be a streetcar conductor at $12 or $15 a week. There is uh, many a uh, white man less fortunate and less well equipped than I am. In fact, I have never been able to discover that there was anything disgraceful in being a colored man. But I have often found it inconvenient. Let me repeat that last now. But I have often found it inconvenient, inconvenient, inconvenient in America. I just told y'all, Burt Williams, just on messing with Zigfield Follies, he was making $1.5, $1.6 million a year back in the 19 teens. That's the equivalent of today's, if you look at inflation, that's what he was getting. He was basically getting in today's money $1.5, $1.6 million a year. Just from the Zigfield Follies, then he's one of the most popular recorded musicians, black or white, of his era. Uh, He was getting money everywhere, doing plays, all this stuff. And yet, <clears throat> and yet, he still had to deal with the race thing. And he died March 4th, 1922. He contracted uh, pneumonia, I believe, he, while he was performing a stage play on a stage tour of the country. I believe it was Detroit where he passed out or fell out. And he died of pneumonia back on March 4th, 1922. And he was so well beloved and thought of by the black community that somebody like Langston Hughes, who was a student at Columbia University, I believe, I believe was a student at Columbia University. He had a, a major test the day that Burt Williams was buried and had his funeral. He decided to miss his test to honor Burt Williams to be at his uh, his funeral and his burial. So, yeah, but, you know, marching on March 4th, 1922. People don't really talk about Burt Williams like that. He's not really brought up in conversation. And that's why it's so important for us to, you know, reclaim our narrative to put our people back in their proper places and their stories as major characters, not minor characters, not the invisible man, but as major characters. So, Eddie Murphy, 35 years absent from Saturday Night Live, made an amazing comeback. I thought it was awesome. Uh, for what it was, Eddie, you know, for what it was, he actually did save Saturday Night Live. Like I told you, black folks, we got the habit of saving white folks and their institutions. I'm in Memphis. I know about it. Tom Lee, a black man who couldn't swim, was able to save a whole bunch of white folks from drowning in the Mississippi River. And these are the white folks end up setting policy uh, for Memphis for decades to come, for better or for worse. He saved them. Without, he didn't know how to swim. He had a boat called Zell. He just saved them. And he was a guest of honor of President Calvin Coolidge at the White House. There's a picture of him in the uh, Rose Garden with Calvin Coolidge. This is Tom Lee. And then they had an obelisk down there on the Mississippi River in Tom Lee Park that was dedicated, I believe, in the early 50s. They said he was a worthy Negro, that he was a worthy Negro. And the obelisk was destroyed by a storm uh, just several years ago. But they also got another uh, statue of monument of him in his boat to Zev, saving somebody overboard in Tom Lee Park. It was interesting when we had a, a the, when the Mississippi uh, River flooded, over flooded the bank. We on a bluff, so we above sea level, but the the river got so high that it actually went over the bluff. <laughs> you know, it's like we New Orleans, and it was amazing to see how the water supported that statue underneath the boat. Like it didn't go past the boat. It was like it was perfect. Like it was actually like the boat was in the water. It wasn't the water. Like it was actually like it was recreated the scene of Tom Lee pulling the person out the water. And it's uh, pictures online. You can show that. It's amazing. But you see the picture behind me. That's my tribute to Burt Williams, Mr. Nobody, uh, a.k.a. Mr. Nobody. Now that character, Mr. Nobody, the character he created, see white folks stole a lot from Burt Williams. Like W.C. Fields, one of his admirers, one of his close friends, he says he's the funniest man he ever saw, but the saddest man he ever knew. Uh, Hollywood owes Burt Williams' estate 
<laughs> royalties because like people like Eddie Cantor, uh, Buster Keaton, and yes, even Charlie Chaplin, Al Jolson, yes, the jazz singer. All these people borrowed heavily from his act. They saw Burt Williams perform on Ziegfeld Files. A lot of them didn't care for Burt Williams because of racism. They didn't want to perform. They wanted to boycott his, his stage plays and his involvement in different you know things. But yet they borrowed heavily from Burt Williams. Just like Elvis did generations later. You know, Elvis got his routine following black musicians around Memphis. Jackie Wilson, Ike Turner, Dr. William H. Brewster. This is like black preacher. He used to go to his East Trig Avenue Church on Sundays to listen to him and his choir perform in Memphis, in South Memphis. And, you know, George Klein attested to that. You know, George Klein, well-known music personality and a close friend of Elvis who just passed away not too long ago. They used to go to East Trig Avenue Church in South Memphis. The building still stands. Like they got a new East Trig church that's next door. But the historic building where Elvis and his folks used to go to listen to gospel music and to sing gospel music with the black people, that building still stands. And Dr. William Mace Brewster was the guy who wrote Move On Up a Little Higher, that famous gospel standard, Move On Up a Little Higher, a little higher that was made famous by Mahalia Jackson. I think it sold over 8 million copies. Uh, when it was originally debuted, I believe. I don't know. You read things. It's like the Irishman. You don't know what to believe, but it's truth somewhere. There's truth in a lot. Truth everywhere. But you got to have discernment. That's why I encourage people to practice discernment and to do your own research. Just don't trust us talking heads when it comes to this stuff. I just wanted to share stuff with y'all because it's on my mind. And I know, like, Ron, we going to get to it, but Look up all the people out, the names I drop. Look them up, man. You won't be sorry to look these people up and to teach yourself about these people. Then to pass that knowledge on to the younger people. We are in the midst of what is known as Kwanzaa now. And I know a lot of people don't celebrate Kwanzaa, including my good friend, the Honorable Judge Joe Brown, for whatever reason. But you can find truth in a lie. You can take good out the bad. You got to find the silver linings. But we got to practice uh, owning knowledge yourself because it's not going to be taught in schools. The things I'm telling you now is not a part of people's curriculums in grade schools and middle schools and high schools and not even probably in college. I remember I had a conversation with my first cousin who's a freshman in college right now. Um, my beautiful cousin, we had a birthday, her birthday dinner and she was asking me how did I know the things that I know. I said, well, what I did was my grandma, the late great Hattie May, my maternal grandmother used to keep a a world book black history encyclopedia from the 70s in her collection with her old encyclopedias. When I was young, when I was elementary, I used to take that encyclopedia out the living room and go into one of the back rooms and just be immersed in all the information for hours on end. This is when I was elementary. I'm about to be 40 uh, next year, God willing. And so I used to be, I knew about Burt Williams because I saw pictures of Burt Williams, Williams and Walker. I knew about Mega Evers and Amy Till just by just. This this is before internet, you know what I'm saying? So I'm dating myself. So this is before internet. Like, you know, I'm learning all about these people. And I go to the school library. I'm checking out biographies on Andrew Jackson and military figures, presidents, uh, all types of people. And immersing myself in this information. Cause I want to know how did they get where they got, you know, where they end up becoming who they were. So I like the I love the backstories. So when it comes to our heroes and sheroes, we need or heroes and sheroes, we need to know the backstories, uh, the the people they the shoulders of the people they stand on. So this is why it's important that I talk about Burt Williams when I'm about to talk about Eddie Murphy and Bill Cosby, because you got to recognize the the forebearers and the ancestors, the righteous ancestors that paved the way. And you know, kids like Burt Williams, they they wore blackface. They ain't talking about they the two realest coons, and they wrote. Coon songs and all that, but they had knowledge of self. Cats like Burt Williams, they, if you go to their houses, their brownstones up in New York and Harlem and places like that, they would have like these amazing libraries of just all this information on black history and world history and geography. This personal collection, like Duke Elton was a historian, you know what I'm saying? It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, but he also he was talking about a lot of black history. Like he did the Black, Brown, and Beige concert at Carnegie Hall back in 43. He was basically talking about the history of black people in America from his perspective. 
No, Duke was up for a Pulitzer, a Pulitzer Prize back in the 60s. I believe it was 66. And he didn't win it. And a lot of people were upset. It's kind of like it was akin to like how Jim Brown should have been the first black Hasman Trophy winner. But it went to Paul Horning from uh, Notre Dame. I believe the guy named was Paul Horning. And he didn't have held the year that Jim Brown had at Syracuse. And people were upset. You know what I'm saying? Now, I ended up going to another orange man a couple years later named Ernie Davis, The Express. They did a movie called The Express. They talked about his story. Unfortunately, he had leukemia, so he didn't play a down of a professional football. Ended up dying too, not too long after the Cleveland Browns, the Jim Brown team, acquired him. Can you imagine having both them guys in the backfield together? You know, Jim Brown and Ernie Davis, The Express, The Amara Express. Look at that movie with Dennis Quaid and the brother from uh, Treme. It's worth looking at who play Ern who plays Ernie Davis. But it's like that, but then Duke said something to the fact that I guess God don't want me to be famous too young. You know, Duke was such a humble guy. You know, even with uh I think Dave Brubeck talked about how he was on the cover of Time magazine before Duke Ellington was. You know, he that's the guy that did take five, the, the jazz penis that composed Take Five. Let's look that up. Take a look, it's all online, okay? But I believe he, in the jazz documentary made by Ken Burns, he talked about how he found out about him being on the cover of Time or Life magazine, whatever the big deal was. It was Duke that brought him the magazine with his face on it. And he felt kind of uh, embarrassed. It was kind of awkward for him because he don't believe that. Hey, no, why is Duke Ellington tell me about, why did I get on this cover before Duke Ellington? Basically, you know, why was I able to get on there before Duke? So, you know, it's funny. Thing that you know, Winston Marcellus, who's a great musician, great, you know, this classical jazz, all this stuff, he's a, a, for, a formidable musician. He won a Pulitzer for his uh, sweet blood on the fields. It talked about American slavery. And what he did, well, he used the blueprint from Duke. Because I had talked to a guy from Smithsonian Institute who's probably been a Duke Elton expert. He told me how, you know, Winston would come to DC to the Smithsonian. And look up, you know, uh, Duke's arrangements and everything, his original notes and composition. And he like he was in heaven, like he was in a big candy store. And then next thing you know, he did a thing called Blood in the Fields that he won a Pulitzer for using the same foundation and work that Duke Ellington used 50 plus, whatever, 40 years ago. He couldn't win it. That's crazy. So you think about Kendrick Lamar, he won a Pulitzer for his rap, first rapper to win a Pulitzer. But it it had been a lot of other rappers could have won one. The one person I think by is Tupac who never won a Grammy, but that's another story. So I'm saying now this about this thing about people validating people. In a system that don't even value your humanity, you're looking for validation as a person, as a black person. The system does not acknowledge you as a whole person. It disrespects your whole person. So you want validation from now. I'm telling you all this history of these people who are phenomenal and they knew it and they stole their story, stole everything and made it white. So you don't think about Mr. Nobody. You're thinking about Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Eddie Cantor, Al Jolson, Jimmy Durante. You forget about Burt Williams. He set the table for all of them to eat, including the black comedians. So we got to go further been just talking about Cosby and Eddie Murphy and Dick Gregory. And like I said, Moms Mabley, no disrespect to them, but acknowledge Burt Williams. Acknowledge him. And by the way, Duke Elton did a song about Burt Williams. He did a sound portrait based on Burt Williams. Duke Elton was a painter. He had gotten a scholarship to go to art school. He turned it down to pursue his music. Thank God he did that. You know, but the way he used music was like a painter using the canvas and paints and brush. Uh, Duke was a brilliant, brilliant man. But let's talk about Eddie Murphy and Bill Cosby. You know, Eddie Murphy said what he said about Bill. You know, uh, he, he he got a Mark Twain honor at the Kennedy Center back in 2015. Dick Gregory was in the audience. Dick Gregory, you know, was in the audience. And uh, I think Eddie Murphy did a crack about, you know, Bill Cosby giving back his uh, his awards, like his Mark Twain award, or they taking it from him, and he you know he, he, he you know impersonated Bill Cosby. We all know from the Raw uh, comedy movie 
that he talked about this way with Bill Cosby. He told him that you need to stop doing all that cursing and all that yin yang. He said that <laughs> he told Richard Pryor about this. He, he told him, tell, tell Bill the chef have a coconut smile or something like that, you know. So it's, it's been well documented that there's been some tension and issue between Bill Cosby and Eddie Murphy. Uh, you know, and we, we heard, you know, Eddie Murphy's side is documented uh, out in public through the raw thing. That's by over 30 some years ago, close to 40 years ago. And, um, you know, on the 40th anniversary, they wanted him to do a Saturday, a Saturday Night's Live, wanted him to do a some type of skit concerning Bill Cosby. He didn't do it in 2015. Now, in 2019, his opening monologue, he referenced Bill Cosby because he said he, he couldn't believe that, you know, America's dead. There was America who was America's dead back then is now in jail. And he's a guy, he's a stay at home dad now with 10 kids. So he would never knew, you know, who knew that Bill Cosby, America's dead, would be in jail. So he, he you know, he did his mimic, uh, mimicry of Bill Cosby voice. And that's it. He didn't do no full blown skit. He just like, you know, because they got that history. You know, he'd been talking about it recently uh, with the Jerry Seinfeld Netflix show in the car with comedians while getting coffee, whatever it is. He talked about that from his perspective. And then you had uh, Bill Cosby publicist. Uh, Andrew Wyatt come out and saying he was a Hollywood slave for what he did. And to be honest, like he's a comedian. It's nothing off limits when you're a comedian, and especially if you want to take the consequences of your of your actions. If you want to put it out there and stand by what you say and do, nothing's off limits. And you know, a lot of people in the black social media sphere got upset with uh, Eddie Murphy not staying on cold. He's a comedian. And also, to further that point, Malcolm X told us about entertainers. 56 years ago, Malcolm warned us about how they weaponized black celebrities against black people, how they undermine our progress. He talked about that in that interview he did at Berkeley, at UC Berkeley back in 1963. It's easily accessible on YouTube online. He, he named names. He even named Dick Gregory and Lena Horne. Uh, you know, what other group of people will allow their leadership to be entertainers, puppets, and and trumpet players and singers. What other, what other group of people have leaders like that? You know, then you say Ronald Reagan was elected president. You know, but I hear what he was saying. Like, you know, why would you allow entertainers, court jesters, puppets to set your policy? Even Dick had to admit. You know, he said, "Well, Michael Cosby, we we gotta be more mature in our understanding." He just Malcolm in that thing was giving examples. You know, we all know now that Malcolm and Dick had a relationship in terms of Dick did support Malcolm things, you know, but Dick had to step away from his career as an entertainer when he came to getting involved in the civil rights movement. He did step away from his entertaining career. He was before Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby said on our senior hall show a couple years ago, I took Dick Gregory's place. Dick Gregory was on his way. He was one of the highest paid entertainers in the plant, on the planet, in the country and on the planet. He was a black entertainer. He was a black comedian. First black comedian to sit on the couch at Tonight Show. You understand? He did the stuff at the Playboy Club in Chicago. Prestigious headliner, right? This is before Cosby with I Spy and all this stuff. Dick stepped away from that once he can't, became friends with people like Mega Evers. See, it was Mega Evers that got Dick turned on to the movement. When Dick started going to Mississippi to support the efforts of Mega Evers, Mega Wiley Evers, who was a World War II veteran who was involved in D-Day. He was you know, he was a member of the Red Ball Express, uh, mostly black truck drivers who, who was driving and delivering food and supplies for George Patton's uh, Third Army. They were a support group. They were kind of like the, like the Tuskegee Airmen of, of truck drivers. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather was a member of the Red Ball Express. He was involved in uh, the D-Day operations after they landed. You know, he was driving the trucks, making sure that General Patton had whatever, the, f the fuel, the supplies, the food, the need to keep his army going across Europe to Berlin. My grandfather, Arthur Taylor Sr., was a proud World War II veteran, proud member of the Red Ball Express, like Mega Evers. So Dick knew his role as the entertainer in the movie was not to be the lead 
it was for him to support the lead, like by raising money, like Harry Belafonte did for Dr. King, raising money for the movement, bringing awareness, using their celebrity status to bring awareness to the movement and to the people that actually were the organizers and the leaders of said movement. But now we got a situation where we think that uh, the entertainers, because they popular, because they rich and because they well known, are the leaders of our movement and they supposed to articulate our struggle, which is not the case. And that's what Malcolm was saying. And the way I understand, don't confuse Eddie Murphy with Malcolm X. He's not Malcolm X. He's an entertainer. He's a court jester. Now, disrespect to Mr. Murphy, but he's there to entertain, to distract us from issues. Entertainment is there as a form of escapism, period. Entertainment is a form of escapism. That's what entertainment is. It's to keep you distracted, keep you unaware of what's really going on. Of the so-called hidden hands. You understand? Hidden hands involving things. And the fact that we got a, a very illiterate society. People don't read no more. People like to be visually stimulated. They, you know, think about it. Um, even when people listen to the radio back in the day, they still had to use their imagination to visualize certain things. So they still was engaged in certain parts of their brains that now you got social media, people go on YouTube. Be like everything is like, you know, oh, we just gonna give you all this, you just take it and we don't question nothing. It's like what Judge Joe Brown said with bread and circuses. The more bread and circuses, the more distracted you are, the more entertained. You don't think of the ask the right questions, you don't know what's really going on, you're just constantly distracted. So really, uh Eddie Murphy, in my opinion, he did not really disrespect Bill Cosby like he could have. He could have did a full blown skit. He just made mention of the obvious and kept it moving. But folks and their feelings caught on to that. And it's bigger than Bill and um, Eddie. And, and concerning Bill Cosby, I'm tired of people trying to utilize and use their pound cake speech as a reason to throw him under the bus. It's BS. He was railroaded. You cannot justify what they did to Bill Cosby and say this, this is just logical. This is right. Even when the other stuff, well, 60 people can't be lying. Oh, yes, they can. It's called a conspiracy. Yes, 50 people can lie. They can conspire. Yes, it's impossible. Where's the evidence? There's no evidence. He did a deposition that have been legally sealed. They broke all type of laws and ethics to get Bill Cosby. Y'all think that's okay? That he's sitting in jail because of Benadryl? Over-the-counter Benadryl? That's why he never admitted to being a rapist in a deposition. He never admitted that he raped anybody. He did admit to having drugs on hand, party drugs, to give the women... Not without them, not without them knowing. <coughs> but what I'm saying is, y'all want to talk about the pound case speech, but y'all, y'all just y'all look at the fact, you know, even go beyond. He gave a lot of money to black institutions like HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. Because he did a lot of things in media. He did documentary talking about black art and black artists' contributions by black history. He, he did all type of documentaries back in the day concerning that. He was concerned about black people's stories being told. They had him and his wife, uh, Camille, has when they interview all the, the pioneers and trailblazers, uh, national what, visionary leadership project, whatever that's on YouTube, where they to you know they interviewed our elders, the trailblazers, the pioneers, including Dick Gregory and civil rights luminaries and all that about their lives, about their advice to the next generation. Uh, some of the best black art collections in the world are owned by the Cosby's. And they you know, when they shared that with the Smithsonian Black History Institute, the African American History Museum, and people protesting him sharing this 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 award winning art collection with the public is like, man, y'all talking about two thousand four pound case speech, but go back to two thousand when black people were getting killed and brutalized by police in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the Queen City in Cincinnati, Ohio, Bill Cosby won the first. Entertainers to boycott Cincinnati because of police brutality in that period. Bill Cosby was one of the first prominent entertainers, black or white, to boycott Cincinnati, to refuse to do concerts and events in Cincinnati because of police brutality there. And y'all don't, I remember when I was in college, you hear something like every other week about people getting killed in Cincinnati, black men getting treated with disrespect in Cincinnati by the police. 
and he was one of the first to I remember that. So in the pound cake speech, it was leaked. He thought he was saying it among friends. And was he wrong with all the things he said? I think we got to start being more sophisticated in our understanding of things and how the media play these games. You know, y'all keep on thinking that they care about black women getting, getting raped and black folks getting mistreated when there's always some type of other motive involved. You know, when, when Bill Cosby, we Dick Gregory has been on the show a lot of times. It was, they were close friends. You know, Bill Cosby, even through his troubles, came to, to Dick Gregory's uh, homegoing celebration in Maryland. He didn't stay there all day, but he made, he paid his respects. And then he made his entrance, but I mean, made his exit, excuse me. But what I'm saying is, Dick said, you know, he got more oil on his property than Kuwait up there in Massachusetts. You understand? We did a show. And y'all getting like, y'all need the talking heads. I, ain't gonna, I don't care how you get the information, just get the information. But I did a show with documentation that show you that, you know, this big energy giant on the East Coast called Kinder Morgan was going out to Bill Cosby's property up in Massachusetts because he was standing with other families. Like you had 400 families infected, I think, at least by them wanting to drill into people's properties up in Massachusetts. They became environmental activists. You understand? Camille did an op-ed in 2014. I believe it was March 2014. I have a YouTube video that talks about the real reason why they went out to, went out to Bill Cosby this time. She did an op-ed about, you know, going against the energy giant, Kinder Morgan, being, you know, they were um, land conservationists. They wanted to preserve and protect the land for future generations. Like, you know, Massachusetts, where you think about uh, Henry David Thoreau, think about Ralph Waldo Emerson. These are the transcendentalists, the transcendentalists, right? The, you know, Henry David Thoreau was down with John Brown. He said, yeah, man, John Brown, revolutionary love. The catch was going against the grain. So this is the area they try to protect that produce people like that. You understand? Folks that were for the people that believe in liberation and the protection of the human race and also the environment. So Bill is in that tradition, Bill and Camille. So she wrote the op-ed piece about standing with the environmentalists against the energy giant, Kendall Morgan. This is March 2014. By December 2014, you know, Hannibal Buress, the comedian. Well, I don't hear about Hannibal Buress no more. You know, he, I guess he was paid to do his job. They paid him, whatever. I said, get on, get on, Coon, whatever. But by the end of the year, that's when all this stuff started coming back out again. About Cosby being a, a serial rapist and all this stuff. Y'all think it's about ethics. This is not about ethics. This is not about justice. This is about land grab. This is about business as usual. In America, ca, ca, ca. now you don't have to believe me. I'm just you look up the Camille Cosby op-ed about Kendall Morgan and about them trying to put a, a, a gas pipeline through their property. See, like Judge Joe Brown told me once, he said, "Ron, if they can't find you guilty or something, they'll, they'll make sure they try to bankrupt you through the to, through the uh, just us system, the legal system. They try to make sure they can bankrupt you and your resources. So what they trying to do? They trying to bankrupt and run them dry." So they'd be forced to sell or even try to get the government involved in this thing called eminent domain. Y'all think y'all own stuff y'all don't own. Y'all think y'all pay property taxes and mortgages on things you think you own. You don't own. Because they can eminent domain your crap anytime. I got cousins, you know, down in Sandy Springs, Georgia. Live, you know, Sandy Springs is a beautiful suburb, a suburb of Atlanta. A beautiful little small town. Uh, you know, it reminds me if I'm in Memphis, kind of reminds me of Germantown, places like that. They just put on notice that they their property, their home, they've been making their home there for years. They raising their kids, their beautiful kids. Their their property is being eminent domain. Their neighborhood is being eminent domain. Domained. You understand? So yeah, they're gonna get paid off by the government for whatever they assess the property to be, but it's not gonna be the money they should get. Cause you can't, you know, compensate them for things like memories and all types of stuff. Like, you know, how they, you know, I know how people improve their properties to help add-ons. You know how people do renovate their stuff. That's not gonna get compensated when the government write their check. I think they're trying to build an expressway through where their neighborhood is right now. 
where they made all the memories. They they trying to you know, they putting in like basketball courts, swimming pools, and hey, we don't care about that. You know, but we put all this money. No, we don't care. We're gonna take what we want to take. See how I understand. The United States was founded on a land grab. So they don't respect your rights. And then the people that say we the people in the constitution, they're not talking about everybody, they're talking about the white man who owned property. That's we the people in the we the people, the constitution, the good old boys, country club contract. You understand? You know, so Cobb is not about what you think it's about. You know, Cosby and a lot of these girls at the Playboy Mansion, why they not dragging Hugh Hefner's legacy through the mud? And Hugh Hefner, he died at the right time. He died a little bit after Bobby Dick Gregory. You know, Bobby Dick Gregory, big break came through, messing around, messing with, Dick, uh, with Hugh Hefner. But then when Hugh Hefner, I tell you about Bobby Dick Gregory and black celebrities, uh, Bobby Dick Gregory warned you about these black celebrities as well, but he had to step away from the entertainment field. And uh, when the Kennedy administration, yeah, JFK, when he uh, suspended uh, the government benefits, the government benefits of the black people down in Greenwood, Mississippi, because of their activism. See, this is JFK. They don't tell you about that, right? The Kennedy administration, the government suspended uh, food stamps and whatnot from the black folks in Greenwood, Mississippi, back in '63, because they were trying. They were getting too rowdy. They wanted their rights to vote and all that. Dick Gregory, through the help of his friend Hugh Hefner, uh, charter a plane. And fill it up with all types of food and supplies for the people of Greenwood. You know, he gave them, delivered them food and all types. He did what the government refused to do. And he had help from Hugh Hefner. So he was, you know, Dick had his thing. But also Dick was a, was a dear friend of Bill. And he was trying to tell y'all, you know, they killed his son because he tried to acquire a network. He said, it didn't happen. I said, they got, they got New York Times articles talking about him trying to acquire a network. This has been documented in history. It's not no, oh, this is made up black people hotel fish stuff. No. This has been documented through newspaper articles that he had people that was kind of helping. Just like think about how Ice Cube and LL Cool J were trying to acquire those 22 uh what regional sports networks. And then I think Disney outbidded them or whatever. They found a way to give it to Disney. They had silent partners helping them. It was not just, it was the front people, LL Cool J and Ice Cube. You know, of course, they had their money and resources involved, but they had some big players behind the scene, those silent hands, those invisible hands helping them, trying to get that, and they were cheated. It's like um, with Suge Knight and Death Row. Suge Knight was forced to file bankruptcy when they cheated him. See, that lawsuit was not legitimate, but they stole Death Row from Suge. And now Suge is doing 28 years in prison. Because he's trying to secure a bag, then he's not that had no business trying to secure uh secure because he got cheated by the legal system out of his own company, Death Row Records. This is online. Look all this stuff up. This stuff is coming out, man. See, stuff is coming out, it's made available, but y'all not paying attention. Y'all not paying attention. And y'all too distracted, you know, football, fantasy football, all this crap, you know, celebrity. These folks are weaponized to distract you. Keep your eyes on the prize, man. So with Bill Cosby, it's so deep, and we write him off. Cause I, a lot of people don't know. I mean, I talk to sisters and stuff. They get mad. I said, look, I know your uncle may have did this to you, but your uncle was not Bill Cosby. You can't put that on Bill Cosby. Whatever, you got raped and all this stuff. I hear this stuff. You cannot blame. It's not right that he's in jail like that or in prison. The way they did it, they didn't do it by the book. It was unethical what they did to Bill Cosby. And he might die in prison. But I respect him because he refused to uh, acknowledge. He's not going to cow down. He's like a, he's a political prisoner. You know, it's like with uh, Stanley Tookie Williams, the co-founder, because really Raymond Washington was the one that founded the Crips. But you know how they do that stuff. It's like you had two other black dudes in the car with Rodney King when they beat him up real bad. They never talk about the two other black dudes in the car with Rodney King that night. So you got to understand, you know, so much stuff that they tell you, you can't trust it, man. The official story is the official lie. Oh, my God. But um, you got to ask yourself a question. Why is all this stuff relevant now? Why do we care about Eddie Murphy and Bill Cosby? Why, why are they doing right now to keep us? Uh, preoccupied with the BS. 
another thing y'all got to know, the most important news stories of the week come out on Friday. So the most important news and stuff like that of the week comes out on Friday. So by the time Monday hits, you forget about it. Because the weekend, you know, people doing things they want to forget about the whole week. Especially you working jobs you don't love and dealing with people you don't love. You want to get away and escape. So you want to turn on some football. I mean, football every on Saturday and Sunday. Full schedule football, entertainment, all this stuff. Uh, whatever you want to look at. You keep your mind off of reality. So this is what they do. So it's never been a dull moment. You know, it's always divide and conquer with this system. You think about uh, Jackie Robinson and Paul Robeson. You know, Jackie Robinson was used to, they pitted Jackie Robinson against Paul Robeson. You know, he did congressional hearings and Jackie Robinson disrespected Paul Robeson, but Paul Robeson would not take that bait. He would refuse. He said, I'm not going to get down there with you, brother. I know what they're doing. They're trying to pit one against the other. But Jackie Robinson could not understand that until, he, you know, near the end of his life when he saw how he was used by white business people in order to take money out of black folks' hands. And he died a broken man at the age of, what, 52 or 53 years old. But he had the body of an 80-year-old man. He was legally blind, diabetic, all this stuff. Lost so much, lost a son. It's just sad. I think his wife is still alive, Rachel. She ought to be 100 years old right now. Okay. He's probably still alive. But a fool, Jackie. And Jackie didn't understand until it was too late. And the thing about Jackie Robinson, he, he he never stood for the national anthem. He never saluted the flag. He was a patriot, but he didn't, he felt like America was not his. It's like Burt Williams thing. He's like, you know, I don't have no problem being a black person, but it's an inconvenience in America to be black, to be a proud black man. So the same thing you look at with Joe Lewis. I mean, Joe Lewis was a patriot. You know, just government destroyed Joe Lewis. He was such a patriot. He was doing free boxing matches. Gave the government a million dollars during World War, World War II. And the IRS destroyed Joe Lewis. And they try to use Joe Lewis against Muhammad Ali. I mean, even look at, you know, they try to use Dizzy Gillespie, the, the beboppers, and all them. They try to go against Louis Armstrong and the old timers, you know, the guys who set the table with the innovators, the young, young lions, young Turks, they trying to pit one against the other. You know what I'm saying? But then what's the crazy thing about it, uh, if you ever go to New York at the Queens, go up to Louis Armstrong's house. It's, a, it's an amazing house. Years later, a lot of cats like this, Gillespie and such, they were moving to Queens to be closer to, to Pops, to Louis Armstrong. So a lot of them cats end up relocating to Queens just to be closer to Louis Armstrong. But the white business interests try to pit one against the other. It's kind of like you look at Jack Johnson, his refusal to fight uh, black heavyweight contenders. You know what I'm saying? He will fight the white ones, but he want to be the only, one and only black champion. But look at his background, where he came up out of Galveston. You know, call him the Galveston Giant, but these do the uh we call them I want to say battle royales. You know, you look at the movie Bolden, it opens with one of those where you have all these black dudes blindfolded. Not Bolden. Is it Bolden? It was included in the movie Bolden about the first Jazz King Buddy Bolden. And then also in the James Brown biopic, they include the Battle Royale, whatever they call that. Where they fighting blindfolded, the black guys and last one standing, they collect the money that was thrown on the ground by the white people. So that's how Jack Johnson came up in Galveston. I think it's called the Battle Royale. Y'all correct me, whatever. I don't care. But uh, I know I think about wrestling, but you know, they call it, you know, they'll fight each other blindfolded. So that was played out in the James Brown biopic a couple years ago. And also it was featured in the, uh, the Buddy Bowden movie that came out this year. And also it's a part of the great American classic novel, The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. He has a battle royale scene. I think it's called it's called battle royale. I don't know. Y'all correct me. But uh, I'm jumping all this in for me. But look, it's a game. It's a game. It's a game. That's how they play it. So this Eddie Murphy and Bill Cobb thing is nothing but a game. It's like you know, it's funny how we can make fun of each other, but we can't attack the real enemy, the source of our oppression. It's like you know, it's okay to make rap songs about black folks killing other black folks, but when it comes to attacking uh, institutions and organizations naming names of the people who actually are uh, oppressing, suppressing, and repressing us, repressing us, we get all scared. You don't hear that music. See, all this stuff is Cointel Pro. You look at uh, Tupac, you know, Tupac to me is not just a rapper. I listen to Tupac every day. I'm not a thug. I'm not a gangster. I'm not a gangbanger. But I listen to Tupac every day. He's the only rapper that I actually listen to every day. 
He's been dead for 23 years. This is several, I don't care if it's bootleg Tupac, if it's uh, Eminem distorted his vocals because he don't know how to make no beats. Tupac, uh, OG Tupac, I don't care. I mean, Tupac is amazing. He's a phenomenon. He's like Bob Marley. You know, he's one of the guys he's bigger than just music. He's a cultural icon. It's bigger than his rap. So people say, well, you know, this is this. No, no, Tupac is just Pac. Tupac to me is like, he's in the same class as Marvin Gaye and Curtis Mayfield. He's a message music man. He understood the times. He tapped into that, that vibration, that frequency. So it's different with Pac. And they got rid of Tupac. They got rid of Tupac. See, we think it's all about, see, the surface level is some gang BS, right? It's all that, you know, thing. But it's like, think about the games. Who created the game? Think about how they were created. You know, they fighting over sets that don't pay property taxes on. You don't own the set. You don't own nothing. You know, think about the real gangsters. Think about Mayor, Mayor Daly who came up in the game. He became the mayor of Chicago. That's gangster. You controlling precincts. You controlling neighborhoods. You controlling stuff. He legitimized his game. But yet Larry Hoover and Jeff Ford can't legitimize theirs. They in Supermax prisons. You understand? They're not allowed to be the mayor of Chicago. Jeff Ford was illiterate. And he was able to help Richard Nixon win Chicago in Illinois. Illiterate black man was working with Fred Hampton. A very literate and articulate black man who they killed at the age of 21 while he was sleeping next to his pregnant fiance. With his namesake in her belly. See, they let Jeff Ford and Larry Hoover live, who organ, but they got rid of the one that could politicize those guys and help them understand their value and worth to their people and help them understand the value and worth of their people, their resources, of their assets. It's like with Pop. They got rid of Pop. So, yeah, y'all can say this and that, yeah, yeah, but you got to understand he's a Panther Cub. The Panthers were compromised. We know that now because of the counterintelligence program, but Cointel Pro is still going on. It's like with John Lennon, he was a message music guy, a music guy, but he was a product of the Tavistock Institute out in England. The research is Tavistock Institute. The Beatles came over to America at around the same time the Warren Commission came out on the on the Kennedy assassination. Folks started questioning the Warren Commission report. It wasn't it was some 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 crap going on with that. Then next thing you know, the Beatles, the Beatles, the Beatles come over here with the British invasion. And they're making songs to get kids hooked on drugs and stuff. To get their minds out the Kennedy assassination. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, that's LSD. Hey Jude is heroin. And John Lennon confessed that much to Dick Gregory, who was his health guru. Dick Gregory helped Yoko Ono and John Lennon get off of drugs. For good. You know, John Lennon wrote Imagine, one of his biggest songs in honor of Dick Gregory. I think Dick Gregory gave him like a prayer book. And it inspired him to write this song. He talks about this. This is documented. And he talked about how they were utilized to get the youth off the wrong track. And then he started becoming the uh, face of the peace movement. And they got rid of him unpeacefully. He got killed at the Dakota up in New York. Come to find out, the guy who was doorman at the Dakota was a known CIA assassin. You can look all this stuff up. So with, you know, weaponized black celebrities... Like, you know, I, I, I like to look at movies. I love entertainment, too. But you got it's a, it's a time and place for everything. And with the Cosby thing, it's not funny what they did to him. You know what I'm saying? Eddie Murphy, whatever. You know, like the Gumby stick, uh, skit he did. I love the Gumby skit he did because it reminded me so much of, of Dick Gregory. You know what I'm saying? I, I miss Dick Gregory cursing me out like that and because really it's love it's not about disrespect it's love it's like look at me you schmucks look at me i did all these things you tell me i'm irrelevant i'm not irrelevant i did all this i set this table for y'all y'all not recognized i saved y'all give me my propers that was dick was talking about give me my propers i put myself out there i sacrificed so much i did tell my story don't forget me remember me so this is what i'm saying in this thing Remember Burt Williams. Remember the folks that came before. Understand what they're doing. This is a game. You know, Dave Chappelle ain't Malcolm X. He's a comedian. He's an entertainer. You know, but Bill Cosby, he knew Malcolm X. He worked with these people. I remember seeing a, a biography about Red Fox or Bill Cosby, one of them. And it talks about how 
Bill Cosby and Red Fox had a club together out in L.A. And Red Fox had Red Fox was a good friend of Malcolm X. He knew when he was Detroit Red when they were washing dishes at Jimmy's Chicken Shack up in Harlem. This is the same place where Charlie Parker used to wash dishes while he listened to Art Tatum play. So we, we were powerful people. So Red Fox was real good friends with Malcolm X. He, he knew when he was Malcolm Little and Detroit Red and when they was hustling. And him, Red Fox, and Bill Cosby owned the club. Bill Cosby was put, put all this Black Panther radical stuff on the club. He said, no, 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 man. Can't put that. Look, it's a business, man. Don't put all that politics and stuff in our club. We cater to everybody. So Bill Cosby was down in his own way, but also he played on I Spy. And there's a critique that uh, George Jackson did of that. You know, how, why are we, as black folks, praising this guy who's working for our enemy to undermine us as a people? That was George Jackson, uh, the field general of the Black Panther Party. You know, Soul Dad Brother had to say about that. Look that up. I think this in his book. One of his books, he talked about the critique of uh, I Spy. But that's uh, media. That's technology. And we got to understand that. And with this Bill Cosby uh, thing and Eddie Murphy thing, it's a non-issue. It's not important, you know, at this point about that. It's more important that we study how they was able to get Bill Cosby. And my understanding from a Washington Post article, I believe, that Bill Cosby was trying to warn Eddie Murphy. It didn't go down as Eddie Murphy says in his raw stand-up routine that he actually was trying to warn uh, Eddie Murphy of the people of this thing called fame and how they utilize that. You know, you, you don't want to you know, put yourself as a target because really we are all targeted individuals. I meet targeted individuals. They don't even know they're targeted individuals. I know uh, this things be going on, man. Shadow banning is real. I, I experienced shadow banning. I don't have to prove it because, you know, how am I going to prove it? It's kind of weird. You know, I don't trust my numbers. Don't trust a lot of things. Do double takes and stuff. But um, I want to thank everybody who has been supportive of the We All Be movement, uh, making this thing still go. Like I said, some days I just feel so out of it, you know, but I'm glad and thankful of donations of people buying things like art, like the T-shirts, is Muhammad Ali, the king. Not Kaepernick, Muhammad Ali. Kaepernick is not on that level. Kaepernick is not on that level. But... I don't even know why I said anything that could be of use, but if it has been of use to you, please utilize it. But do your research uh, on the situation. And you know that they got some dirt on Eddie. Look at Oprah. Oprah is going after black man, but hey, that's a guy that she endorsed called John of God. Look up John of God out of Brazil, who's serving, I guess, almost 20 years in prison for sex trafficking, uh, for moving humans and babies around, sex farms, all that. You know, John of God of Brazil. Oprah Winfrey endorsed him in her TV show, I believe, back in 2012. Now he's doing football numbers, or he's close to it, in prison for sex trafficking and stealing babies. And I'm just, this is a surface thing, but look up John of God, Oprah, Brazil. And uh, why are they not talking about that? What is the fear of a hetero black male in this country with some with some guts and some conviction standing up for themselves. Why do they fear black men of that caliber? Why do they like killing black men of that caliber before they reach their prime? And there's different ways to kill people now. It's not just blowing somebody's head off on a hotel or motel balcony. It's like in your food and your educational, miseducational indoctrination. It's like in your environment, the air you breathe, the water, uh, the chemtrails. This stuff is real. And uh, like I said, it may take a lot for me to do these things. I, I, uh, 2020 going to be an interesting time for me. Uh, if you like the words from Brother Herb, please spread the word. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, We All Be TV. Uh, please donate. Support the movement because information is power and knowledge is currency of the universe, but nothing's free. Like I said, I, I'm dropping names, telling y'all stuff. Look all this stuff up. You pay a price. That's why sometimes I wait on doing some of these things. I don't do nothing at all. You know, I be sitting on a lot of stuff. But it's like, man, I don't know if I want to do all this stuff, man. It's like, you know, I'm a stranger in my own hometown. You know what I'm saying? People look like I'm a, a space alien walking around here. How to talk to family about these things I, to be on my mind. Ancestors be talking to me. That's why I'm doing it. These things sometimes early in the morning. But um, this is hard to 
really just be. And I'm learning in 2020. Dick told me this a couple years ago. You got to get your rest. And uh, we'll see. But I try to do as many of these as I can and put out other forms of information for the people. But I hope I made some points about, you know, something that needs to be relevant or something that you can use. PayPal, Google Pay, R2C2H2 at gmail.com. Once again, you could donate through PayPal, Google Pay, R2C2H2 at gmail.com. Also, cash app, dollar sign, R2C2H2. Cash app, dollar sign, R2C2H2. So, yeah. So, this is your your friend, Brother Ron. About to sign out. I'll be dropping some more videos uh, in 2020. But before 2020 hit, I mean 2019, I uh, got some exclusives. Man, I got some stuff that if I didn't see it for myself, I wouldn't believe it. You know, uh, people going through some things, but... Like I said, a lot of us are targeted individuals. We don't even know it until it's too late. So uh, ring the alarm. Ring the alarm. Ring, 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 ring. Thank you all for listening, uh, for taking time out your schedule to receive this, whatever it is. Dr. King said that human salvation lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted. I'm a proud member of the creatively maladjusted. And uh, thank you all. In the words of Duke Elton, we love you madly. Keep on producing and pushing. Hey, everybody, this is Brother Ron. I am asking you all to do me a big favor. Think about supporting the We All Be movement. Your donation is tax deductible. The We All Be Group Incorporated is a recognized 501c3. And I'm just asking you all because I want to keep on bringing y'all quality work uh, through the way that I know how to do best. And uh, I'm going to sing my praises and toot my horn. A lot of y'all were not hip to Dick Gregory until Brother Ron brought him on the We All Be platform, until that Django review we did. Y'all seen another side of Judge Joe Brown and Judge Joe Brown's message has been amplified. But it was We All Be that brought Judge Joe Brown to y'all back in 2014. And so many others. And we covered so many things. So help us out so we can help you all. Peace. <laughs>